We're talking New York Giants draft, fits, surprises, anticipations, and everything in between with Joe DeLeon, who is the host of the First Team Podcast over on the Believe Network. That's coming your way next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Chena. Happy to have you with us as always. And thank you for making us your first listen of the day or of watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day. And on today's program, our special guest is Joe DeLeon. He is host of the Believe podcast called First Team Podcast. It's a draft podcast, and he is going to share with us, hopefully, some of his uh, wisdom and knowledge on, on the upcoming draft, which right now we are inside of 10 days. Hard to believe it, but it's coming up quickly. So, Joe, thanks so much for hopping on with me today. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, and I, I've got you know so many different teams to take a look at during this draft cycle, but as I was telling you before we hopped on, I'm a big Giants fan. I used to work for Big Blue View, so every opportunity I get to to talk about the Giants and their draft expectations, it's it's always exciting. And the one thing, and I'm sure we're going to get into it, I'm hoping that we can maybe get a good receiver this year. Yeah, I mean, listen, everybody has different uh, takes as to what they think the Giants are going to do, and it makes it hard when you're picking down at number 25. And I want to start there with you, Joe, uh, because when you're picking down that low, and let's hope this is a problem the Giants have every year because it means that they've done well the year prior. But when you're picking down that low, t- it, sometimes grades on your draft board tend to cluster up to where you can go in any number of directions. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how you've set up your board, but does it make sense for the Giants to maybe trade up or trade down out of that 25th spot? Or do you think, you know, given how the, the board potentially might fall, they should just stay put and you know, they'll get a, a good receiver there or a good cornerback there. I think this year, especially, it fits well with what the Giants' needs are. So you brought up the receiver, uh, the possibility of them taking a corner. There's really good corner depth in the back end of the first round early on in the second. So they don't need to rush to go and get somebody. They don't need to move up to go get somebody. I also think that this receiver class is not that strong. And I I know that sounds bad for a team that needs receivers, but for the Giants' sake, they don't need to be in the top 12. They don't need to be in the top 10 to go get a guy that's going to be a nice complimentary piece to the group. But I I just think in general, for a team that's picking at 25, the approach just, it needs to be best available. What guys are going to fill needs on your roster that are the best available guys that you have graded across the board? Don't overthink it. Don't overcalculate this. I think when you start to get into a rush of trying to make those trade ups, if you're not desperate, don't give up capital, use all those picks to fill out the rest of your roster. And that to me, I believe is the best approach. And that's, that's what Joe Shane did in his first year. And I I would expect similar results. And maybe there's that possibility that they do trade out. Uh, Bill Belichick, I think has notoriously been one of the people who's done that the most successfully trading out of the back end of the first round and picking up extra picks. But uh, anything besides trading up in my eyes makes the most sense for the Giants. Yeah, I mean, I I could see a scenario where maybe they trade up. I mean, you know, it's especially if one of those cornerbacks starts to slip. I mean, that and mm. speaking of which, the cornerback class this year is historically deep. I mean, do you see more of a value with picking a cornerback in the first round, or do you just say to yourself, you know what, we can probably get a starter, a day one starter as late as the second round or third round, and maybe we just go in a different position? I wouldn't necessarily say you can go and grab a day one starter in the second round, but if you're trying to fit certain roles, you can definitely grab those types of guys. So in the second round, someone like Clark Phillips or a Brian Branch or is a type of guy that is going to thrive in the slot. Those guys aren't going to be prioritized in the first round because they're role specific players. But for uh, for Martindale's defense, having those variations of players to play in different sub packages like those two guys, I think are perfect. But at 25, I don't see why they can't be in a spot to draft Keely Ringo from Georgia or to draft Deontay Banks 
from Maryland. I think that they're going to be in a really advantageous position where, yes, they might miss out on the opportunity to get a Christian Gonzalez or a Devin Witherspoon, but just because they don't get those guys and they're not rushed to move up and go and get them doesn't mean that they can't get somebody that is a strong contributor uh, to what Wink Martindale is looking for to build out his defense. What position would shock you if the Giants decided to go in that direction in round one? One that I, I this one and you can't say came quarterback my, either. I, I was just about to say that because they're hosting a uh, <laughs> they're hosting a visit with Hendon Hooker, and I saw that this morning, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, is there really any chance? Because I don't think Hendon's going to be around in the second round by the time the Giants are picking. So I'll leave that off the table. I'll completely take that uh, take that off the table. I think the one that would be the most shocking, but is is certainly plausible is if they drafted a, a guard or a center. And the reason why I say that is that there are good center prospects. There's good guard prospects like Osiris Torrance, um, like John Michael Schmitz, like Luke Whipler, like Joe Tippmann to fit any of those spots. But I don't think their value necessarily fits going in the back end of the first round. I have them graded as early second round picks, but it would not surprise me if uh, in the event that the Giants wanted to just address that interior offensive line, get ahead of it, try and bolster that grouping because it's been such a weakness, then just draft somebody that maybe is a little bit higher than they have them graded on their boards. When you look at how the first round is shaping up, I mean, is there anything that's really significantly changed over the last several days that might maybe push some some of the players that maybe some of us thought weren't, wouldn't be available to the Giants at 25 down the board a little bit more? I, I think one thing that right now is is really shifting is what Adam Schefter had reported on yesterday. Now, I know that it's smoke screen season. I know that we have to take every bit of information with a grain of salt. And it sounds like the Texans might not be excited about going after a quarterback and these quarterbacks might go later. That, to me, is going to shift the need for edge rushers up. I think a lot of those edge rushers are going to be off the table. If the Giants did want to get any defensive lineman or any of those edge rushers, I don't think that they're necessarily going to be available. Uh, but that to me seems like that is the biggest adjustment to what our expectations were for the draft. Overall, I still think that what we've been talking about and focusing on, especially for the Giants, for how the ordering of things are going to end up working out is, is kind of sticking to where it's been. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that as well, that, you know, maybe the quarterbacks are going to slide down the board a little bit, but mm. one position that I doubt is going to slide down, and I, I say it's probably more of a need than receiver is cornerback. And, uh, you know, let's, we talked a little bit about that before, but, you know, mm. just how deep can, do you think this class is for quality cornerbacks? What round do you think is the absolute latest where you, where you then start to see a drop off? I I actually would go as far as saying into day three, there's going to be a lot of fantastic options for that, that corner position. And again, I think that as I was discussing earlier, it depends on the type of role and the type of player um, that you're trying to go after. And I, I think that one of the names that has really pushed their way up this board, that is somebody to really pay attention to on day two um, that could go in that conversation of what you're asking me earlier is Emmanuel Forbes from Mississippi state, who, I think epitomizes this, this corner class in the sense that there's a lot of really good players, but a lot of different body types, a lot of different styles. And maybe not all of these guys really can fit with certain teams. And Man Emmanuel Forbes is one of those guys because he's like 170 pounds. He's barely 170 pounds, very, very thin player, but a very talented one. And then you've also got guys like DJ Turner from Michigan who can go somewhere on day two is a fantastic athlete, but maybe a little bit less refined than some of those first round guys that I brought up. But I'd say you can get key contributors for, uh, especially with what we know Wink Martindale looks for in his corners as far as into early day three. Hey, Giant fans, Grand Slams, no hitters and double plays are back. And there's no better place to get in on the action from MLB than with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now FanDuel is giving new customers a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if their first bet does not win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no sweat first bet. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. 
now let's talk about fits for the Giants. You know, looking at round one, who g- give me like two or three names that you think realistically will fall down to the Giants at 25 that are fits? Yeah, I think that the biggest needs for me are, as mentioned, wide receiver. We talked about uh, is Quentin Johnson, the guy that they want to go with. Is, is Jordan Addison maybe somebody that they pay attention to? Josh Downs, say Flowers, or some of the names of the receiver that I love. Again, we talked uh, talked a lot about these corners. I also pay close attention to those interior offensive linemen. I think that's a little bit early for the Giants to, to approach in that particular spot. Um, but I, I think that you can't go wrong with just adding the best available defensive player. Is Trenton Simpson from Clemson somebody worth considering? And I, I remember my whole time that I was at Big Blue View, I kept suggesting linebackers in the first round. And it's always met with the, the notion that the Giants don't take linebackers in the first round. But I would be very excited if Trenton Simpson was the pick because I can't remember the last time that I've been excited about a linebacker group for the Giants. And again, I know it goes against every every fiber of our being, but the guy's a great athlete. He is a, a really instinctual football player, and he can just fly all over the field. He fits with what we know that Wink Martindale has sought after in linebackers. Like I, I kind of get some shades of what Patrick Queen has done early on in, in his career when he was under Martindale. So uh, if they want to go linebacker, I think that's also – maybe a bit of a dark horse position you need to pay attention to any other positions. I mean, I, I think you mentioned interior defensive line. Would that be something maybe they look to given that, you know, they're trying to get Dexter under Dexter Lawrence under contract long-term and also maybe get, uh, you know, an, an extension done with Leo, who's a little bit older and, you mm-hmm. know, starting to wear down a little bit. I would feel as though addressing interior defensive line would be better until later on in the draft. But at that same time, if they did want to select somebody in the first round, the names I would pay close attention to, Brian Brzee from from Clemson, who could maybe slide a little bit, uh, he could fit that role that Dexter Lawrence plays if Dexter Lawrence does not end up returning because of the contract situation, because he's a big, strong body. He does take up space. He's got a little bit of a pass rush upside to him. An interesting wrinkle if Dexter Lawrence does come back, and if maybe they just want to add a a different look to the defensive line. I really like Kalijah Kansi from Pitt. He is well under the physical thresholds that we look for any defensive lineman at any spot. He's six foot. He's 285. Very, very athletic, explosive, really strong. He's so low to the ground that interior offensive linemen can't keep up with him because he's so small and low to the ground and he gets underneath their pads. His pass rush upside, I think, is significant. And if you put him on a defensive line like the Giants, that's already fleshed out. You don't need him to be a three down player, per se, to play against the run in run heavy, obvious situations. But because you have those other big bodies, attention can be pulled away from him. Get him in one on one spots and he could be a highly productive tackle for loss and sack type of a guy. So if I were to name some of those defensive tackles, I would I would throw those two guys out there. What about its center? You know, you have John Michael Schmitz, you've got Whipler, you've got Tipman. Um, the Scruggs, who you could probably get later on in the draft, which of those centers, and we, I think we can all agree the Giants probably would be best off uh, drafting one, but which one do you think is a good fit for what the Giants do on offense? I, I would throw one out there that I really believe should be on the Giants' radar is Ricky Stromberg from Arkansas. I, I think that he is going to be the Creed Humphrey of this class. I think that he has been so overthought throughout this process, and we know what happened with Creed Humphrey a couple of years ago. He was, for some reason, pushed down on draft boards. I think he was a second or a third round pick out of Oklahoma. And he's one of the best starting centers in the NFL right now for the Kansas City Chiefs. Stromberg is a multi-year starter. He is a veteran player. His instincts are fantastic. He's got great flexibility. He's got great pa- power. He checks every box for me. And I think that the feedback I've seen from scouts is, they're a little worried about his body type and if he can maintain a good weight in the NFL, which is such a weird, dumb thing to overthink uh, for a guy that is as talented as, as Ricky Stromberg. But a, another name, if they miss out maybe on John Michael Schmitz or Luke Whipler, or Joe Tipman, who I've mentioned before, I think Brain Daniels from Utah, who was a left tackle at Utah, an all-conference player, really, really consistent in college is best suited to play inside and could make that transition to center. 
and has those movement skills and the length to be a really good starting center if they do want to go that route of somebody to develop and then make that transition to a new position. One of the sneaky needs for the Giants, in my opinion, is depth at outside linebacker or edge rusher, wherever you want to call the position. Who are some names that, you know, maybe we're not talking about and linking to the Giants that you think maybe we should be? I think one particular in the first round uh, to pay attention to is Will McDonald from Iowa State. Uh, another guy that fits like what we know has been the prototypical Wink Martindale defensive end. He's a tall, long, thinner defensive end, stand up outside linebacker rusher, and he's just got fantastic bend. He was playing in a really weird role at Iowa State where they were asking him uh, to play as like a, a hand in the dirt, big body defensive end in the 3 3 stack. And he just. He did a good enough job for what was being asked of him, but I think in the first round, he makes sense. Someone like Nick Hampton from App State is a day three pick. I would like to throw out there as someone to acknowledge who uh, is under the radar. And we know that Martindale does like to have rotational options. And I think that Nick Hampton serves that role as somebody who can come in just in obvious pass rush situations. So uh, I'd toss his name out there maybe as a more of a late round sleeper to, to take into consideration. When you, you know, with us getting so close to the draft, I mean, obviously the, the, the whispers are picking up at a, at a frantic pace, but what are some of the things that you, that you are hearing might develop that might be surprising to some people, especially in the first round? I think that the biggest thing for me that I've heard throughout this whole process is the possibility that Will Levis goes a lot earlier than we're all comfortable with. And I I think a ton of people feel that Will Levis is the fourth best quarterback of the group. There's a lot more to be confident in with the other guys. And I know that Anthony Richardson's a massive project, but he is a younger player who's still figuring out the position. Will Levis has a lot of complications, especially with his decision-making. But what I think that the NFL, and it started at the beginning of the season, they see a guy like him who's a multi-year starter. He's got a strong frame, good leader, tough kid. He played through completely messed up fingers against the, I think it was in, against the old Miss where he completely mashed his fingers. He goes back in the game. He tries to finish the game. Really tough guy fits all those, those boxes that you like to check. And it just, it feels like Will Levis might end up going a little bit higher than expected. One of the things that I heard that suggested that is that the Texans are not the biggest fan of Bryce Young because of his size. And he probably won't be on the board. They're not the biggest fans of CJ Stroud because of other reasons. And they're the type of organization that values that experience. So I think that that one, again, the major one for me is that Will Levis might come off the board at a weird spot and might even be at number two as the second quarterback in the class. Wow. That would be a surprise given, you know, the way a lot of draft experts have the the board stacked up. I mean, always some kind of surprise that pops up in the draft. I think we can all agree. Let, let's talk about sleepers because I always like to ask draft analysts their choices for sleepers. Who are some names maybe in day three that have giants written all over them that, you know, we're, again, we're not talking about on the outside, but maybe the NFL community, the scouting community is talking about. So there's, there's three guys that come to mind that I feel like I've graded them much higher than the general consensus has. My first one that I love is, is Ty J Spears. And I think that he's risen a ton throughout this process. The, the two lane running back who had a phenomenal senior bowl. He finished the season off with the amazing game that he had against USC. I just think he has fantastic vision. He's a strong athlete. I, I think that you can get a starting level running back out of him. And, and maybe for the Giants, where there's a lot of uncertainty with Saquon's situation, is he traded on draft day? If that does happen, and maybe if he's traded next season, having someone like Tajay Spears in the in the mix, I, I think that could absolve some of that uncertainty at the running back position. And he has every capability to be a, a quality starting running back, somebody who can be a, a snap to snap player that doesn't need to be a rotational type player. I think that he's going to succeed if he ends up somewhere like Miami uh, in that Shanahan type offense. He could be really exciting, but the Giants, again, should consider paying attention to him. Uh, the other one for me is Tucker Kraft from South Dakota State, the tight end. I don't think he's got enough love in this process. I think everybody has propped up guys like Sam Laporta, guys like Dalton Kincaid, and they're good football players. But 
Tucker Craft dealt with an injury. He's coming from a small FCS program that won a national championship this past year. The guy is just so well-rounded. He's he's a great blocker. He's tenacious. He's aggressive. And he's got really easy hands. He's a great accelerator, a phenomenal athlete for uh, for better than what his testing numbers were. I think that for how good Dallas Goddard has been in the NFL, he's got that capability to play up to that level and to be a number one tight end. And maybe Darren Waller's not going to be the long-term solution. He's he's just not. He's on the older side. So if you want to draft Tucker Craft early on day three, at the end of day two, he could be that second tight end and eventually take over, uh, take over that role. And then if I were able to just throw out one more, Zach Pickens from South Carolina hasn't been graded very highly at defensive tackle. Big body guy, former five-star recruit, twitchy, uh, has finally kind of come into that five-star billing at South Carolina in this past year. And I think that he has the upside to be a full-time starter along the defensive line. Interesting, interesting. You know, every year in the NFL, we see how teams copy off of one another, whether it be something on offense, something on defense. What about in the draft? Is there a specific trend that you anticipate teams are going to start to maybe lean into more that maybe some of the successful teams of, of recent years have done? I, I think that if if we were to pinpoint something that has worked successfully in the past, I I feel as though going after these vertical tight ends is something that a lot of teams are, are everyone wants their own Travis Kelsey. And I think that this might be the year that we do see more of those guys come off the board and early Dalton Kincaid is one who has been really pushed up, who I think is a fine football player, but has been described as this uh, late first round pr- prospect. I think he's got some limitations. It's not much of a blocker, but because he has that after the catch ability, he has that vertical threat ability. Uh, I think some teams are going to get excited, maybe draft him at the end of the first round. Luke Musgrave is another player who I think might get overdrafted for that description because he is great linearly, does not change direction very well, does not block at all, but he is a threat, kind of like what Mike Gusecki is going to be doing for the New England Patriots this upcoming season. So again, everyone wants to find their vertical tight end threat, and I think that that's what the big trend is just going to continually be on a year-to-year basis is, is going after guys like that. Based on your scouting and your grading of the players, Give me one player that you really want to see on the Giants that you would be disappointed in if they didn't pick him. I think, and this goes back to the, my desire to see a, a wide receiver selected early. I, I would love if Zay Flowers was the Giants pick at 25. He is uh, my second highest graded, or no, sorry, he's my number one graded wide receiver. I'm, I'm speaking ahead of myself. I really, really love what Zay Flowers brings to the position. He's smaller, but great long speed. He has that vertical ability to stretch a defense, but his change of direction ability is, is just silly. And I know that the Giants have a lot of smaller receivers right now. They don't have that big body. They haven't really figured that out yet. But him in this offense, I think, can be an after-the-catch threat. I think that he can be somebody you put in the slot who's going to catch as many balls as you throw his way. could be a high-volume receiver. Again, I'm a massive fan of Zay Flowers, and I think that if that's the pick, it's a slam dunk for the New York Giants. You know, we always talk about positional value, and I'm sure the topic is going to come up when Joe Shane speaks to the media on Thursday again. But, you know, for people not familiar with the term and what it means, can you just give us an overview of it? And do you think that's going to really play much of a factor in some of the decisions that are made here? I think overall, it certainly will have an impact in the draft, not so much for the Giants because those positions that have an increased or decreased positional value aren't necessarily on the radar, except maybe wide receiver. But for what that means is that running backs are a position that are not necessarily a luxury. It's it's a position where you can have a, a mid-tier running back playing behind a really good offensive line or multiple mid-tier running backs and have really good rushing production. Like the Philadelphia Eagles, Miles Sanders and Kenneth Gainwell were a really good pairing. But the flip side of this, the the quarterback position is one that has inflated positional value. We're going to have guys that are massive projects like Anthony Richardson and Will Levis drafted in the top 10, whereas other guys at other positions that are projects are day three picks, day two picks. Because of the 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 scarcity of trying to find those guys that can be high level starters at the quarterback position, 
teams are going to be more willing to take those shots. But the only one I think that comes into factor here for the New York Giants is at wide receiver. And as I've said earlier, this receiver class isn't as good as we've seen in the past. It's it's one of the weakest that we've had. There is no alpha dog. There is no number one receiver that is going to be a 1,500-yard guy, in my opinion. I don't think we have that. We've got a lot of great secondary and tertiary options. But there's a really strong possibility that despite that being mostly great it is late first round picks that some guys go as early as 15 or sooner. And that might play the giants hand of if they really like one of these receivers that they do have to trade up because they don't want to miss out. So uh, again, receiver, I think is one that might end up factoring into what happens for the giants in the first round. All right. One more question for you. The giants have 10 picks left. Do you think they take all 10 or do you anticipate maybe they look to trade up someplace or maybe do they look to trade back and pick up some picks for next year when they're not scheduled to have any comp picks? I think realistically with, with how Joe Shane has, has built and been around rosters that were built back when he was with Buffalo, it would make more sense for him to trade back. And I, I just, I really fixate on how this roster is currently built. It went from the previous year, to the roster being just riddled with holes. And I feel a little bit more confident coming into this draft the way that you continue to build on a winning program, in my opinion, unless you are a team like the Jets that need to go up and get their quarterback or or a team like that that doesn't really have a settled quarterback position that needs to move up and go and get somebody like the commanders, the situation that they're in. I don't know if it necessarily behooves the Giants to do that. Hold on to those picks. This is a class that's got a lot of really good depth. If you can pick up as many picks as possible, it's really, a really a great year for uh, for the Giants to do that. Well, it's going to be interesting. There's always a curveball thrown by the teams. You know, we anticipate something and then <laughs> out of left field comes this curveball that we didn't see coming and it, it, it never fails. And, you know, there's, there's going to be some frustration. There's going to be some celebration. There's going to be a lot of second guessing, but you know what? That's what makes the draft so much fun. All right. He is Joe DeLeon and he is the host of First team podcast over on the Believe Network. That's B L E A V. Make sure you check them out. Giant fans, thank you so much for tuning in to the Lock on Giants podcast, making us your first listen of the day, or if watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day. Coming up the rest of this week, we're going to have Joel Corey on the show. We're going to have takeaways from GM Joe Shane's presser. So make sure you keep it here on the Lock on Giants podcast. Giant fans, we will see you again tomorrow.